Please stand with me, please, for the reading of God's Word this morning. Reading in James chapter 1, beginning verse 22. Not an unfamiliar passage, but uh, one that's very challenging. It says, But be doers of the word, and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man who looks intently at his natural face in a mirror. For he looks at himself and goes away and at once forgets what he was like. But the one who looks into the perfect law, the law of liberty, and perseveres, being no hearer who forgets, but a doer who acts, he will be blessed in his doing. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for the word and the challenge that it represents. We pray that this morning you will impact our hearts and our lives as we look at this in a little more detail. Lord, as always, we pray that you'll hide the messenger and make the message clear by the power of your Holy Spirit. We pray, Father, for the rest of this day. We look forward to the time tonight. I pray that many will come back to not only enjoy the fellowship, which I trust will be the case, but also the, um, the message of this, of this film. Again, giving us reason to, Lord, uh, not that you need to prove your word, but to see why we believe that it's true. Lord, those of us who have been around it for long enough and been uh, trying it in our own lives for so long, know the truth of how real it is, and we pray that'll be the experience of everyone here. Bless this time together, Lord, use it for your glory. Will you be lifted up, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated, and uh, turn with me to James 1, if you're not already there. There's a wonderful verse in Psalm 86. Verse 11, the Lord says this, David writing, he said, teach me your way, O Lord, that I may walk in your truth. David didn't just want to be taught God's word so he would know something. He wanted to be taught God's word so that he would walk in that word. And that's really the thrust of the message this morning as we look at this, these verses in James chapter 1. They remind me of a, of a father who walked in and found his teenage son reading one of the magazines that he knew belonged to his teenage daughter one day. And he said to his son, why are you, why are you reading that girl's magazine? And the young man said, well, dad, there's an article in here that tells women where to go to meet men. He said, I have to read this so that I know where I need to go so I'll be sure I'm there so the girls can find me. Well, that was a young man who was reading with a purpose, right? He wasn't reading just to get more information. He intended to do something about it. And the challenge out of that, beloved, for us with regard to the Word of God is that we be coming to any time we come to the Word, we come with the expectation it's going to require something of us that will be good for us and glorifying to God and determined to carry that thing out, whatever that is. That's the way to come to the Word. That's the way to read the Word. Our, our, our series is Treasuring the Word. From James chapter 1, verses 19 through 26. Last week, we looked at how to listen to the Word in verses 19 through 21. We are to listen, we are to listen readily. We are to listen reverently. We are to listen repentantly. But today, we, he's going to take us a little deeper here, how to learn the Word. How to learn the Word. And the thrust of the passage is, learning is more than just compiling information. True learning involves getting the information and then doing something about it. For example, you could read a lot of books about how to hit a baseball, right? 
But if you go stand up against Clayton Kershaw, you're going to find out very quickly it's about more than just book learning, right? You, you learn how to hit by doing. And the Word of God is the same way. We learn how to live in a, a life that is not only pleasing to God, but that's going to be good for us by practicing it, by doing it. And so we learn by doing. The great the great pastor, W.A.W. Uh, Tozier, A.W. Tozier said this, he said, so wide is the gulf that separates theory from practice in the church that an inquiring stranger who sees both would scarcely dream that there was any relation between them. Someone who heard the Sunday morning sermon and later watched the Sunday afternoon conduct of those who had heard it would conclude that he's been examining two contrary religions too many Christians want the thrill of knowing right, but won't endure the inconvenience of doing right. That's pretty convicting, isn't it? And I'm afraid, unfortunately, it's all too true. In the case, in, in, in all of our cases, at many times, that we're, we're not just, but, but we don't want to be just theory and no practice. Not just receiving, but also responding to the Word of God. So that's what we want to see this morning, not just listening, but learning. Three things here that this passage is going to challenge us with to help us do exactly that. The first is that true learners see the word as liberating. This is really important. True learners see the word as liberating. We might well ask ourselves, how come sometimes when we know what the word says, we don't obey it? Jonathan Edwards knew the answer to that question. Jonathan Edwards, probably the greatest theologian and pastor that America has ever produced. He said this. He said, we always do what we want to do. We always do what we want to do. Always. Now, I know some of you sitting there, if you're like me and you're thinking, well, wait a minute, that's not true. I do a lot of things I don't really want to do. I got to work every day. I don't really want to do that. But Edwards is saying, his point is, he says, yeah, I, I know that. But he said, the, the truth is, you do it because you want to. You do it because you can see a greater good out there by going to work than if you didn't. You see the possibility of taking care of your family and providing for them. And so you really do want to go to work more than you want to go home, and want, want to stay home. And if you don't believe that, just let somebody take your job away. Find out how happy you are. We do, he says, what we want we, we, we always do what we want to do. So why would we not obey the word of God? Because we don't want to, beloved. <laughs> Let's just be honest. Because something that we think is going to be more pleasurable has come along and caught our attention. And while we believe that in general what God says is good for us and has our best interests at heart, somewhere deep down we think, yeah, but in this case, in this instance, at this point in time in my life, this isn't true for me. I know better. That's how we think. Verse 25 in our passage is going to challenge that thinking big time. He says, but the one who looks into the perfect law, the law of liberty, and perseveres, being no hearer, who forgets, but a doer who acts, he will be blessed in his doing. Blessing, in other words, wholeness, flourishing in life. That's what the word means. Happiness is for the one who is the doer of the word. Let's just break this verse down a little bit. He says it's the one who looks into, looks into, and the wording that's used there means to peer intently. The picture you should have in your mind is somebody who sees an ant crawling across the floor. So they get on their hands and knees to examine it, and then they bring out their, you know, their uh, microscope or their uh, magnifying glass to look at it even more closely. So intent are they on in finding out what is this ant doing, how does it do it, what's it carrying, and so on. They're peering intently, and James is saying that's the way you got to come to the Word of God. You need to peer intently. There is so much buried beneath the surface in the Word of God. I hope you found that out. I hope you are learning that. I hope you are learning. It's for those who dig. 
that the real riches of the Word of God are. And so he says, I want you to examine this perfect law. I want you to understand every nuance of it. The blessing is for those who will peer intently. But then he says it's the perfect law. Now, what does he mean by the word law? Is he talking about the Ten Commandments? Is he talking about the Torah, which is the Hebrew word for law? That was the first five books of the Bible in the Jewish Bible. They called it the, the law or the Torah. When we say the Bible, we find out that the word law has many meanings, the, and the context has to determine what's in view in a specific context. In this context, the way the word is used here, it's referring to the whole of Scripture. The whole of Scripture. James uses that word several times that way. Jesus used the word that way. For example, in John 10, 35, Jesus said, it is, is it not written in your law? And then he quoted from the book of Psalms. Now, the book of Psalms was not part of the law, the Torah in the Hebrew Bible. It was part of what they called the writings. So what Jesus was doing was using the word law there to refer to the whole of the scripture that was available in his day and time. And James is doing the same thing here. James is talking about the word throughout. James and Jesus both know that the word is normative for us. Not just the commands, but everything. The examples, the poetry, the prophecy, the wisdom literature, the metaphors, everything in the Bible is to have an impact on our life. Remember last week we looked at Psalm chapter 1, where in one of the phrases, the blessed person, the happy person, the one who is flourishing, the person, that person is the one who delights in the law of the Lord. And on his law, he meditates day and night. Speaking of the whole word of God. To be shaped by the word is to be made whole. Beloved, God has given us this wonderful gift. And the, the, the better we know it, the more we know it, the happier our life is going to be. It doesn't mean that it's going to take away all the problems. It doesn't, but it allows us to be able to face them with greater faith in God, with, with, with greater contentment, whatever life has to throw at us. It's the Word of God that we need, and the Bible is to impact every part of us. James says, that's the person that's going to be happy. That's the person that's going to be blessed. Now, he gives us two things that will help us treasure this word. First of all, he tells us that it's perfect. It is the perfect law. That means pristine. This is the law that is sufficient and it is comprehensive. There is absolutely no mistake to it. There's no problem with it. There's no place that it will lead you astray if you study it and understand what it's really saying. This is something you can trust intimately. There's nothing else in the world like this. This is the perfect law of God. David says it this way in Psalm 19. He said, the law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. Look at all the positive things that happen as a result of this perfect law of God. He says, he says, the precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. I mean, who wouldn't want to claim the promises? Who wouldn't want to know what this has? We rob ourselves when we refuse to, first of all, listen, and then we refuse to obey. The Word of God, beloved, is perfect for what we need. It's perfect. Paul picks up the same theme in 2 Timothy chapter 3 in the New Testament when he says all scripture, all of it, is breathed out by God. Literally, God breathed. It's all one word. He's saying, yeah, men may, may have written it, but they wrote it at the behest of God and it's breathed out by him. And it's all profitable. It's profitable for training, for reproof, for correction, for teaching, that the man or woman of God may be complete. Equipped for every good work. There's nothing that we lack in terms of how to live life that isn't here in the Word. It's all here. 
But it's a question of learning it, which means to first of all know what it says and then do it. It's perfect. So it's not just perfect, but it's also the law of liberty. It's the law of liberty. Now this is where many of us really stumble because we don't really see the Word of God as being a, a freeing thing. We see it as being a restrictive thing. Didn't you grow up that way? I mean, in my home, it was, you know, the commandments were there. I mean, and, and, and whether it was dad saying them or the Bible saying them, those two got confused in my mind before I was very old, right? right? One carried the same weight as the other one. And it, you, you had a tendency in that environment, and, and, it, and it's not a bad environment, but you have a tendency to see it as restrictive. And so we come at the Word of God. You know, we think of the Word of God as when it gives commandments, and, when, and, and even the very word law just seems restrictive. You know, when I go down into the, they're talking about parking down in Greeley now, right? And I don't know what all the issues are, but you know, you, may, you go down there and, and it says you can park on this side of the street, but there's no parking on that side of the street. That's the law. That seems restrictive. I can park here, but I can't park there. And that's how we tend to look at the Word of God. But do you know that's not how Jesus saw the Word of God? And it's not how we need to see it if we see it accurately. Jesus said this, John 8, verse 31 to 32. He said, if you abide in my word, if you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples and you will know the truth. If you abide in my word, that means not just kind of, you know, have your verse of the day in the morning in two minutes, but it means to really begin to absorb this word into your life. If you abide in it, if you're working at knowing what it says and then doing it, then you're truly my disciples and you will know the truth and what? The truth will set you free. Beloved, the truth does not restrict. It sets us free. You say, well, how can that be? The Word of God has a lot of restrictions. Thou shalt not do this, thou shalt not do that. It's all through the Ten Commandments. It has a lot of restrictions. It's true. But when we think of those as bondage, beloved, we've got the wrong definition of freedom. See, the problem isn't with the fact that there are restrictions. The problem is with our definition of freedom. Freedom, let me give you a definition that's, we think of freedom as no restrictions. I can do anything I want. That is not true freedom. Freedom is the ability to do what I was, was built to do. Let me give you an example. You take a fish, he's swimming around in your goldfish bowl somewhere, right? And that fish has gills. With his gills, he can extract oxygen from the water. You can't do that. I can't do that. But that little fish, he can do that. And then he's got fins. The fins help him, you know, be mobile through the water. And all you gotta do is watch him for a little bit and realize, however well you may swim, you can't swim like that guy can swim, right? He's got gills and he's got fins. So he has the ability to navigate through water, but now you take that little fish out and you say, fishy, I'm gonna expand your world. You've been in the water all your life. I'm gonna let you see what the world is like on dry land. You are free to go wherever you wanna go. And you and I both know what's gonna happen. That fish is gonna be dead before he can go anywhere, right? Because he's not built to be outside the water. The same way that you and I aren't built to be inside the water. And so you throw us out in the middle of the ocean and say, hey, you're free to do whatever you want, right? And the only thing I can really do is drown. Because boundaries establish, restrictions establish things that free us to be who we really are. That's the way to look at freedom. That's what true freedom is. It's the ability to fulfill our destiny, not what we might want to do at this particular moment in time, but to do what we were built to do. God's restrictions are freeing, beloved. They don't deny us anything. They align perfectly with his will for our life. Proverbs 4.12 says, there's a way that seems right to a man or a woman, but its end is the way of death. If we live without God's truth, we will eventually destroy ourselves. That's how free we are. We are free to destroy ourselves. But if we want to live a life that is 
pleasing to God. If we want to live a life that's pleasing to ourselves at the end of the day, that brings contentment, satisfaction, and brings flourishing in life, we need the rules that God lays down. The, 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 the Word is what frees us for this. Perhaps you've been over to uh, you know, the Royal Gorge at some point in time. You ever been there? You remember that bridge that goes across the Royal Gorge? How would you like to drive that without any restrictions on either side? That would not seem very freeing, would it? What are the restrict the boundary? What do they do? They establish boundaries, and now you can feel free to drive across that thing. You, pre- you won't even hit the restrictions, but you know they're there, and they're there for your safety, and they're there for to, to keep you from going off the edge and destroying yourself. And that is exactly what the perfect law of God is for us. It is the only thing that will never steer you wrong. I'm not saying you can't get truth anywhere else because all truth is God's truth but the only way you can be sure that you're getting the precise perfect law of God is in the word of God it's the only place grasping that truth can change your life you know, the, you know what the, the mark of a God changed person is it's a heart that loves to hear what God wants to say to it The person who really loves God is the person who wants to hear him and then wants to do what it is he's asking us to do. We trust him. We know he would never steer us wrong. And so true learners are those who've realized that the word is liberating. Secondly, the learner, the true learners are those who see themselves as lacking. They see themselves as lacking. That's part of our problem. We think we got it, the world pretty well nailed, right? Kind of got the world by the tail. We know up from down. At least we feel that way most of the time. And then some crisis hits and then we're not so sure. And we don't know where to turn. But if we've been absorbing the word, if we've been abiding in the word, we will know what to do. Because the word of God will see, will show us that our self is lacking and point us to him. So verse 23 says, for if anyone is a hearer of the word, not a doer, He's like the man who looks intently at his natural face in a mirror. Natural face, the face of his birth. The Bible reveals who God is in his holiness. My natural face shows me what I look like. And now I know what, where my flaws are. So I can see my natural face. It reveals who I am. And the word of God reveals who I am in my natural state. It reveals my flaws. It reveals where I am falling short. It reveals the heart is this, that is deceitful above everything and desperately wicked. Listen, your heart will mislead you. Your natural state that you were born into will mislead you. Your heart will tell you things that are not true. It is only the regenerated heart that God gives us when he moves in that will tell us the truth. And we get that from the word of God. It will be responsive to it. But apart from that, we look into the word and then we just look back and listen to the old face that we had before. And the Bible is trying to reveal where we're coddling the old nature. It's the word of God that's living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, dividing a center between the soul and spirit. It helps us see what is wrong with us where I am following the old me instead of the new me. But if I just see the problem and walk away and say, that's too bad, then James says this, in verse 23, for if anyone is a hearer of the word, not a doer, he's like a man who looks intently at his natural face in the mirror, for he looks at himself and goes away and at once forgets what he was like. A hearer who is not a doer is self-deceived. He ignores the word at his own folly. He's like a guy that's on the way to a party, right? And he looks in the mirror, and the mirror tells him, you got food in your mustache, your hair is messed up, you got grease on your shirt from where you were you know, working earlier today, and you look at it and you say, ah, no big deal, that's just me, I'm going anyway, and off you go. Why would somebody do that? I think there's several reasons. Let me just give you two or three of them. Some people look at the mirror and they don't want to change because they don't really look. They just take a, they just take a passing glance. They look at the Word of God as it's a checklist item. I, you know, I got to read the Word today. And so I get it out and I, you know, I spend my five minutes reading something. I don't understand it. 
and I walk away. And I think, okay, I read the word. I feel like I'm okay. I didn't really look. Sometimes that's the way we are. We don't really look. We're like, there was a, there was a doctor, his name was William Ostler. He was a Brit. And he was teaching some of his medical students one day. And he said, uh, he said for this particular whatever disease they were doing, he said, look, here's a fluid. He said, when you've done certain things with this fluid, you can actually, you just taste it and you can tell whether this person has this problem or not. And with that, he stuck his finger in the, in the, in the, in the uh, fluid and he put it in his mouth. And then he said, I want all of you to do the same thing. And he passed, he passed the, the uh, bottle of fluid around. And every student stuck their finger in and put it in their mouth, even though they thought this is really strange. Strange way to diagnose a disease, but they did it. Well, when he got all done, the doctor said, let me tell you what the real lesson here is. The real lesson is you need to observe. If you had been observant, you would have noticed that I stuck my index finger in the fluid. I tasted it with my middle finger. If I'd put strychnine in there, I could have killed all of you. And that's what, that's what James is urging here. If you don't pay attention, if you don't spend some time in the perfect law of God, you can't expect to see yourself rightly. You won't, you, you ignore it because you don't really look. And because you're not observant, you don't know what it's trying to tell you. And you don't know what God is trying to tell you because you haven't given yourself to the Holy Spirit digging in here to find out what it really says. Others might come along and they don't get it and they don't obey because they say, well, the mirror is flawed. Obviously the mirror is flawed. Now they might have said that in James day and been pretty accurate because glass mirrors weren't even invented until the 14th century. So what did they have in James day? Well, they had, they had uh, metal, polished metal, and it was, it was far from perfect. We were, we had an interesting experience. We were walking through Mount Vernon one day, you know, George Washington's house. And in his house, they had a mirror hanging on the wall. And it was really fun to look at because you're thinking to yourself, wow, one day, 250 years ago or whatever, George Washington was looking in the mirror and he was seeing his face in that mirror. Now I'm looking and seeing the same face. Only problem was that mirror was really a mess. It had been there too long. It had a lot of flaws you really wouldn't have been able to look in that mirror and see yourself carefully. And so a lot of people might say, that's the problem. The mirror is flawed. The word is flawed. I don't believe what it says. I see what it says here, and I think that's good for Susie over here, but it's not, that doesn't apply to me. My situation is different. Did you ever notice that, how different our situation is? My situation is always different. It's always some excuse why this doesn't apply to me, it just applies to everybody else. It's for someone else. And so we don't look very carefully. It's like the missionary who used to, you know, he'd shave by hanging his mirror on a tree and a witch doctor came along and saw him shaving one day and he saw the mirror and and he took a look at himself in the mirror with all his paint and everything on and he was aghast at what he saw. And so he, he tried to do a deal with the missionary. He wanted to buy the mirror. The missionary said, no, nah, I, I need to use it for, the, for, for, for my shaving. And, but the guy kept insisting until finally they made a deal of some kind and the witch doctor got the mirror. And as soon as he got the mirror and it was his, he threw it on the ground and broke it in a million pieces. And he said, there, now that thing won't be able to show me this ugly face anymore. That's like the person who is in denial, saying the word of God doesn't really mean what it says here. It doesn't apply to me. It may apply to somebody else, not to me. That leads us to another reason we don't obey is because we think it is for somebody else. You know, it's, it's like, the, this is like the hillbilly who found, he, he was out, they, they he lived in Tennessee and they had some visitors who came in one time and they stayed close by to his place and when they left, he thought he'd go, searched through the trash they left behind, see if there was anything of interest. And he found there a mirror. He'd never seen a mirror before. He held it up and he looked at the mirror and he said, wow, I never knew Pappy ever got a picture of himself. So he took it home and he put it up in the barn. You know, he hid it up there. He didn't want to lose this treasure. What he didn't realize is that his wife saw him taking it up there. So his wife thought, I wonder what he is up to now. His wives will do. 
And so she went and she climbed the ladder, she got up in the hayloft, she found the mirror, she took a look at it and said, she said, so that's the old hag that guy's been running around with. We think it's for somebody else. We think the word is somebody else. Not for me. And God is trying to say, this is for you. It's for me. This word is for all of us, beloved. It doesn't play favorites. It doesn't have exception clauses and loopholes in it. It's the perfect law. So James said, those who hear but don't do are deceiving themselves. Master deceivers, are we not? The true hearer, the true learner is the one who sees himself as the one who is lacking and determines to do something about it. He comes to the word. Listen, here's the way to come to the word. It's the only way to come to the word. Come to the word expecting to change. Right? All of us. We need to come to the Word of God expecting to change. Now, the change that the Word demands may be big or it may be little, but there will be something that God will point out to us that we need to change. You know, if you have a good day, you may say, wow, this is great. I changed that last week. <laughs> You're good to go. But if you come to the Word of God expecting it to tell you something that needs to change in your life, you'll begin to be learning, not just gaining information, but doing, not just being a hearer of the word, but a doer of the word. The learner loves to hear God tell him how to live rather than ignoring God. He treasures the word of God as something that will make him better. He realizes that God knows better than he. So thirdly, the learner sees obedience as life changing, as life changing. Verse 22, but be doers of the word and not hearers so, only. Just then jump down to verse 25. But the one who looks into the perfect law, the law of liberty, and perseveres, being no hearer who forgets, but a doer who acts, he will be blessed in his doing. Not blessed in his knowing, but blessed in his doing. You know, it's, it's great that you've studied the Word of God all your life, and now you're on top of it. You know the difference between amill and premill. Congratulations. You know the difference in the creed of God between sublapsarianism and, and, and supralapsarianism. And when you, when you know that, you can come explain it to me sometime, right? But you know this. You know Reformed theology chapter and verse. Good for you. But that's not the question. See, the question is, has this changed your life? Has this made you more loving? More loving of God? More loving of those around you? More loving at home? More loving with your family? More loving with those that you work with? Has it impacted your relationships in your family with those that are around you? Has it changed you? Has it affected your temper tantrums? Has it affected your grudges that you hold on to because it feels so good to hate this person? Did you ever notice how we love to hate? Love to hang on to the grudge. Somebody did me wrong, we'd almost rather hold on to the grudge than make it or get it made right. That's how, that's, that's how depraved we are. Has it changed you? Has it changed your life? That's James' question. That's God's question. Has it changed you when you've come to the Word? Because you haven't learned it if it hasn't changed you. We were studying in Sunday school class today about the deity of Christ and how it's illustrated in the Bible, but the whole point in Philippians 2 where Paul makes the greatest description of this in the Bible, I think he does it, he, he gives great theology for a practical reason, which is what? I want you to think the same way that Jesus thought when he came and gave, his, gave up everything for you. I want you to do the same thing for those around you. The Bible is always making a demand on us because it wants to free us to be who we were made to be. And so the learner sees obedience as life changing. One of the most challenging verses in the Bible, I think, is John 14, verse 15, where Jesus says, if you love me, keep my 
commandments. It's not a matter of just singing, hey, I love you, Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus. The question is, are you, are you obeying Jesus? Are you doing what he asks you to do? Has knowing him changed your life? Learners love to hear God tell them how to live. Do you love to hear God tell you how to live? Do you come to the Bible expectantly? Expecting to change. You know, I used to teach in seminary. Some of you have undoubtedly done this. We used to have the capability. You could go to the class, and most people did, but you could also just audit a class if you wanted to. Audit meant you could sit on the lectures, but you didn't have to do the homework. You didn't have to do the reading. You didn't have to take the tests. You didn't have to do anything else that was demanded in the class. You could just sit there. And so we had auditors who just sat there, except in my class, I made one requirement of them. If you're gonna audit the class, you have to take the final. You can imagine the results. The auditors always had by far the lowest scores on the final exam. Why? Because they hadn't really learned. They picked up a little knowledge here and there, but they hadn't put themselves into this. Learners, beloved, are doers, and obedience is life changing. And if your life isn't changing, you need to re resurrect the way you're coming to the Word of God. Let me close with one more example. A lot of examples today, but this passage kind of lends it self to them. Suppose that you work for me and we're in a fast moving industry. Things change rapidly, but I have to go away somewhere for several weeks and I leave you in charge while I'm gone. So while I'm gone, I write to you, I send you emails, you know, kind of on a, almost on a daily basis, giving you information that you need. Well, after a few weeks away, I return and upon my Arrival at the office, I'm appalled. I look around, the grass has grown up over the sidewalk. There's a couple of windows broken out. I walk inside. There's the receptionist sitting at the desk chewing gum, you know, watching television. I go back and I try and find you. The place looks like a shambles. There's, you know, waste paper baskets rolling over everywhere. The inventory place is total mess. I can't find anything in there. I find you in the office with the sales manager playing video games. And I look at you and I say, didn't you get any of my, didn't you get my emails? And you say, oh, emails, yeah, we, we got your emails. So they were great. Said we had email studies every Thursday night. Said we, we, we divided up into groups and we analyzed the emails that you sent so that we would understand them thoroughly. We did all that. He said, there's some of us that have memorized every single email you sent. Just tell me, just give me a place and I'll tell you what you said. And I look at you, bizarre. I say, you learned all of that? You meditated on these emails? You studied them? You, but you didn't do anything that I asked you to do? Oh, we were supposed to do something? <laughs> Beloved, God didn't give us this book just so our brains would get bigger. God gave us this book to live by. This is truth to live by. That's why he says in Psalm 86, verse 11, teach me your way, O Lord, that I may walk in your truth. Not repeat it, not memorize it, all of that's all good, but that I may walk in your truth. That's our challenge. Let's be learners together. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this challenge. We acknowledge it as a challenge. We'll confess to you right now that we fail more than we get it right. But our prayer is that by the power of your Holy Spirit, you'll help us to leave here today with a renewed desire to see what your word has to say understand it thoroughly, and then go live it so that we can say we really are learners, not hearers only, but doers of the Word of God. We understand, Father, that if we will do this, not only will it glorify you, but we will get the benefit of living a life that is content 
and satisfied and trusting, free of anxiety, even in a world that seems to be spiraling out of control. Oh, Lord, that we might just see you high and lifted up and want to obey you. Help us to come expectantly to your word. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.